and uh, it is a session of invited talks from uh, uh, Yershov Institute of Informatics Systems. And though I was not formally affiliated with this institute at all, but I was all the time closely connected with people working there. And of course, with uh, Andrei Shov, who was the head of the chair when I was uh, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate student. And then, of course, I feel like I was uh, involved in this institute all my life. So that's make me uh, so just very proud of being now the chair of this session. And uh, so, so uh, I now introduce the first speaker, that's uh, Natalia Garanina, and uh, she will uh, so she will announce the title and explain what she will speak about herself, I, I guess, better. So, Natalia, please, uh, would you show uh, your slides? Share your screen. At least it is allowed. <laughs> Yes, it works. Great. So, Natalia, you're welcome. Um, It's only me, I, I can't hear anything. Yeah, I also hear nothing. I cannot hear. Mm -hmm. Some problems with... Natalia, we cannot um, hear. Natalia, we do not hear you. Не слышно. I think she's reconnecting now. To uh, talk, I want to talk about uh, uh, research um, that uh, is performed by uh, um, my laboratory in Institute of uh, Information System in uh, Novosibirsk. We uh, um, develop uh, a uh, system. It is verification system for C programming language. Our input language is c -Light. It is a representative subset of a C programming language. But uh, semantics of c -Light 
fact is too complex. Uh, thus, we use uh, secure language as intermediate verification language. Uh, C-kernel is a uh, um, limited subset of C-like language, um, but uh, there is uh, semantic semantics for C-kernel language. Thus, we uh, may verify C-kernel programs. We um, translate uh, C-like programs into the kernel program and verification conditions are generated for obtaining the kernel program. Uh, we use uh, uh, proof assistance to um, proof obtained verification conditions. Our goal is automatic deductive verification of C program. But it is a too complex uh, goal. Uh, the main challenges uh, are uh, following. Uh, loop invariance problem, error localization problems, and uh, mm, uh, automatic verification condition proving. Uh, we uh, use uh, the set of methods to uh, solve uh, this problem. Let us consider the problem of loop invariant. Uh, we um, we uh, may uh, uh, consider the classical inference uh, ruler for while loop. This inference uh, ruler is based on uh, uh, loop invariant. Mm, the task of loop invariant defining is uh, mm, very um, important task in the case of uh, deductive verification. We may solve this task in special case. We use symbolic methods of verification of definite iteration to solve this task in the case of definite iteration. Uh, let us uh, consider uh, such kind of loop as a definite iteration. Let us uh, define uh, two operations, chew and rest. Uh, operation chew returns an element uh, from uh, data structure as operation rest returns data structures without uh, application of uh, choose. Let us consider uh, the following loop. This loop executes uh, once for each element of uh, data structure S. We may define a special replacement operation for such a loop. We uh, are referred this operation as a, a rep. Uh, it is a recursive function. Uh, we define this function using uh, uh, two and uh, rest operation. Uh, if uh, the loop uh, contains break statement, uh, then uh, we um, suggest that uh, the loop iteration are continued by the uh, loop value 
uh, is not changed. Uh, the loop value is the value of repopulation. Let us continue. Let us consider special kind of uh, uh, loop definite uh, iteration of uh, one dimensional array with n elements. We may define rep iteration as uh, uh, recursive. Uh, uh, function by uh, n uh, parameter in this uh, case. n is the length of uh, array. And we may propose the following inference uh, rule in uh, uh, this uh, uh, case. Uh, this rule is based on replacement of uh, uh, loop variables, it is uh, V, by the value of uh, rep function. This inference rule uh, does not depend on uh, invariant. Let us uh, consider uh, this um, example. Uh, specification of uh, this function told uh, us that this function uh, checks existence of array element that greater or equal than k. But uh, there is error in uh, this function in uh, line eight. Uh, we uh, should uh, use um, uh, opposite uh, uh, if condition in uh, this. Uh, uh, case. But uh, um, uh, we uh, generate a verification condition for uh, this program using the slide where system. The effect of a loop is replaced by value of uh, rep uh, function. Let us note that uh, we um, cannot um, prove this verification condition due to error in the source program. And uh, let us consider the following uh, question. Question about error in a program. We uh, should uh, help user of verification system in the case of error. Uh, Danny and uh, Fisher. Uh, proposed uh, the following method. They uh, suggest to uh, find correspondence between verification condition and source code. They suggest to supplement uh, sub formulas of verification condition with special semantic labels. Uh, these labels uh, have um, uh, type and uh, they store us uh, lines of uh, source codes corresponded to these formulas. The type is uh, the main part of semantic label. For example, if uh, uh, sub formula 
in verification conditions uh, is uh, supplemented with uh, semantic label if with the if type. And uh, um, let us consider inference ruler for a while. Uh, this ruler demonstrates idea of Danny and Fisher. We uh, uh, infer uh, uh, her uh, triples and uh, uh, verification conditions supplemented with uh, semantic labels. And we may see that invariant I is supplemented with uh, three different kinds of semantic label depending on uh, position on invariant in obtained for uh, triples and verification conditions. Uh, we uh, define partial version of inference ruler for definite iteration. This inference ruler uh, differs from uh, source uh, by uh, uh, supplementing the with semantic labels rep function. And uh, let us uh, um, consider the same example. We um, have inferent verification conditions supplemented with semantic labels for um, uh, uh, this uh, program. Uh, but Danny Fish proposed uh, uh, not only semantic labels, but all the algorithms for generating uh, explanation of verification condition. Danny Fisher suggests to use special text templates for semantic labels. Um, we uh, may extract labels from verification condition and uh, create list of uh, uh, semantic labels. For each element of uh, this list, we may uh, write uh, a text template and uh, then we uh, um, may obtain text in natural language. For example, it is uh, a text that we uh, have obtained uh, for um, one conjunct uh, from a verification uh, condition. We uh, may see that um, reading of uh, reading this text may help uh, user to understand verification condition. And um, uh, the uh, 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 third problem is the problem of automatic uh, proving of uh, verification condition. This task is uh, uh, too complex due to rep function in our case because we uh, uh, obtain verification condition with uh, application of recursive function, rep. But uh, SMT solvers does mm -hmm. not uh, support uh, reasoning by induction very well. 
Thus, we use uh, such proof a system as SL2, and uh, we define uh, strategies uh, for automatic proving verification condition. ACL2 uses uh, applicative common lisp as the input language. The main feature of ACL2 is uh, the uh, well level of automation because of ACL2 is based on reasoning or on recursion function by induction. However, we should help ACL2 and other uh, proof assistant um, to uh, um, prove uh, verification condition in automatic mode. We uh, define the special strategies uh, for uh, proving verification condition. Let us uh, consider example of this strategy. Let us consider goal as implication from C to X, where X contains uh, uh, application of uh, rep. Our strategy generates two lemmas. Uh, the first lemma is a statement about uh, execution on, of break in uh, the case of uh, premise uh, fee. And the second lemma is a statement about not uh, the execution of break um, in uh, the case of premise fee. We uh, have defined a special field loop break uh, of uh, return value of rep function. This field is true if and only if uh, in the case of execution loop break. Let us uh, consider uh, this uh, program uh, without uh, error. We use uh, uh, correct if condition in uh, uh, this case. And uh, uh, let us note that verification condition is a conjunction of um, two cases. Our strategy uh, results to generates over two lemmas. And uh, both lemmas uh, has been automatically proved by induction by on n parameter. The first lemma is the lemma that break uh, is executed in uh, the case of uh, first premise. And the second lemma is lemma that break uh, in loop is not executed in the case of second premise. ACL2 has automatically proved verification condition 
jūs dėri vis bus lėmas. Our goal is automated deductive verification of C programs. And we plan to extend definite iteration by new kinds of loops and apply a symbolic method to new kinds of iteration. Also, we plan to develop strategies that can help user verification system to localize error. And we plan to develop new strategies for proven verification condition. The symbolic method of verification on different iteration is described in the first reference. The initial method is described in the second reference. Implementation of symbolic methods of verification of definite iteration is described in the third reference and the implementation of semantic labeling methods is described in the first methods. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, so, sorry for this uh, bit inconvenient uh, organizing, but uh, it was an interesting talk. And now we have uh, uh, just a bit of time for short and urgent questions. So questions, please. Can I <coughs> so yes, can I ask something? Yeah, sure. So, so how, how do you, uh, it was an interesting talk. So, so how do you generate the verification conditions? Uh, is there, uh, do you use this, uh, some low level uh, representation or directly from the C code? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, could you please uh, repeat your question? Okay, so, uh, so uh, how do you create the verification conditions? So I understand that C program must be translated into lo logic. So how do you do that? Is that uh, do you use a low level representation for that? Yes, we have a very interesting situation. CTS, okay. Because input um, C light program mm -hmm. is translated into C kernel yeah. program. Okay. Verification conditions um, are generated for C kernel programs. But obtained verification conditions, we may consider as translation of a C kernel code to ACL2 language. But how? Thus, we, there is map from source C code to ACL2 language. And we have defined semantics of C into ACL2 language. Okay. Okay, thank you. May I ask a question also? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. 
Well, uh, what about scalability? In particular, if you uh, use uh, semantic label labels, it makes uh, much it makes uh, verification conditions well at least much more much much more longer. Uh, I believe it implies some uh, well times longer, and because of this, scalability is also a question. Do verification condition with semantic labels look uh, as huge formulas, but uh, theorem proof uh, does not uh, process uh, semantic label. Uh, semantic labels uh, may be considered as invisible for uh, their improve and the uh, uh, existence of semantic labels uh, um, uh, and uh, complex of proving does not depend of existence of semantic label um, user of a verification system also does not uh, see a very, uh, semantic label. User verification system only see uh, explanation of verification condition in, uh, in text on natural language. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so some more questions? Can I ask one more question if there is time? Yeah, sure. So my experience from verification is that it is often better to reason backwards from the goal towards the premises and that it is easier than from the premises towards the goal. Uh, can you comment on that? Is that, is that, uh, is that wrong or is that uh, right? I want uh, to say that our research is uh, initial uh, stage yeah. of uh, the big uh, path for uh, automated deductive verification of C program. Uh, it, uh, it may be considered as a uh, first step. Yeah. on uh, this uh, way yeah. and uh, thus we plan to consider more complex examples than uh, the following uh, one Dmitry вопрос был uh, backward and forward просачивание а ой Backward is easier. Yeah, that was my question. Uh, let yes, us exactly. exactly. In parents, uh, rule in uh, the um, uh, bottom of uh, this uh, slide. Uh, this uh, rule is uh, backward uh, uh, strategy. This yeah. strategy allow us uh, to avoid using existing quantity. Okay. If we use a forward strategy, we um, obtain existing quantity in the case of uh, assignment operation. And yes. backward strategy allow us to uh, use only replacement yes. of uh, um, uh, variables by its values. Yes. Uh, that's a good answer. Yes, I think also. Um, thank you. So, so then, uh, thank you, Dmitry, once more for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, so just, uh, we are a bit out of time, I'm afraid. Irina, Irina, 
uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but Natalia wrote me in Telegram that she still has microphone problems. Uh, oh, because see. of this, I did not interrupt, interrupt questions and answers. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, but I believe then, then we have we have more time for discussion. Yes, basically I believe we we can uh, we can, for example, uh, to postpone Natalia talk for tomorrow and should okay. conclude this session. I am sorry for this technical problem, but well. So so just it's nobody fault. So just mm -hmm. happens. Just. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so. so 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 then if there are uh, maybe some comments questions for uh, uh, talk by Dmitri but actually he answered all yes, questions we, since we have some time I would like to ask question and uh, yeah, a question yeah, sure. uh, uh, well during the morning session especially the second morning session we could uh, see a great progress in uh, software verification quite complicated and huge software uh, uh, huge uh, huge software uh, software pieces of code verification but for me it is still very strange still people like in your case are struggling with small pieces of code so how do you explain this uh, roughly speaking controversy between uh, huge projects being uh, that are for that are claimed to be formally verified and still complicated verification of small piece of code Mitri do you understand my question yes could you please comment I also Sorry. appreciate we have some some free time if anybody would like to to provide some observations comment remarks on this topic i heard uh, that uh, invariants uh, are defined manually in the projects presented in the morning session mm -hmm. we um, try to avoid using invariant. Uh, thus, we try to solve this uh, problem automatically. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, approach is uh, difficult. Uh, thus, our examples are small. Uh, are just small. Um, uh, but we plan uh, to uh, consider more complex examples. Examples presented in the morning session are um, uh, well challenger for us by the way you can take a look at uh, our project with simple uh, functions working with memory uh, this part of uh, our specification is uh, openly available on uh, uh, github but nevertheless, I would say that the I, I, I don't see so big contradiction because Alexei, uh, still, I said controversy. I said controversy, not contradiction. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, okay, good. So uh, that's a good actually point uh, for a discussion because uh, uh, it's uh, a movement from two different sides and both uh, sides are quite important because uh, still when we try to prove full functional uh, correctness we still need a lot of manual efforts and it's still not scalable tasks 
And actually, work that Nikolai presented and we do is a try to uh, make scalability better, at least make more automation. Uh, but uh, it can provide only uh, partial progress. And uh, <laughs> of course, for uh, big step forward, uh, we need uh, some uh, new ideas. Well, C is a very hard language to verify. It has very, it's very hard. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for comments. And then Dre Klimov uh, also has a question, a comment. May I, may I ask a question? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I have a, a general question for role presentations which talk about verification of C code, may I articulate it. Uh, 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 Dmitry, in the beginning, you uh, I, I listed the problems uh, which are to be solved uh, in uh, such a task. Uh, um, among them, what are the problems specific to C with pointers as compared to languages, uh, modern languages, which are based on managed platforms like uh, uh, GVM, uh, MS.NET, uh, uh, no, etc. Uh, I understand why uh, in, in institutes like uh, the Alexander Petrenko's team deal with the problems because uh, uh, there is uh, uh, there is their main implications. But when theoreticians uh, deal with low such low level languages with specific problems, I am so, uh, I have such a question. Do I understand my question? Yes. Precise questions, what are particular problems among you have solved, which are uh, connected with uh, C, uh, as compared to a similar subset of Java, for example? We may see example of our memory model in this slide. In verification condition, exactly. Uh, this verification condition contains application of two functions, mem and md. It is map uh, from object uh, from uh, from object to its address, and uh, uh, the second is the map from uh, address to value. This memory model allows us to support pointers, but it is um, uh, a simple memory model. And uh, um, uh, we do not uh, use special case or strategies uh, to reason with uh, the, this memory model. We may consider this task uh, as um, the next uh, big challenge of our research to reason about uh, uh, this memory models in automatic mode. Now we can uh, prove uh, a program contains mem and md, but uh, using uh, proof assistant. So. Thank you. My question uh, so that such a uh, simple memory model does not allow me to prove correctness of some uh, intuitively natural uh, uh, programs. And, uh, so, is there more time for questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, is there some more time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I would like to understand. So, what is MD1? I understand that. Let me read. So, MEM is, is the memory address that is that is Q, right? M, uh, this uh, MEM in the. I see M E M Q M E M E. That's the memory address of Q. Is that right? 
Then, okay. Uh, may I uh, change my presentation? I yeah. want uh, to uh, say, uh, to, to, I want to show another okay. interesting. Okay. Yes, I am uh, here. Okay, I think you could always equate uh, variables with the memory address because they, they are never used in another way. So I think you could uh, do without this function, uh, actually. But maybe I'm wrong. Okay. okay, it's an object with address MD is a map, is mapping from object's address to values. Okay, if uh, it's contains, uh, okay. Okay, I understand this and you use them. Okay, I understand this. MD is a map uh, yes. from. Um, uh, yes. MD is a map uh, from object to address, and MD is a map from address okay. to value. Okay, understand. Uh, that the combination of two maps may uh, uh, give uh, the value of object. Okay. Okay. But I think uh, that uh, variables are never used different than uh, as their address, right? So you could equate them to the address, or is there a situation where they could be not equal to the address? We do not consider address arithmetic. Okay. We consider each address as an interpreted uh, constant okay. uh, without uh, plus minus operations on address. Thus, we may uh, uh, describe our memory model uh, use uh, such uh, simple axiom uh, uh, using uh, operation uh, update uh, and uh, delete. Okay, mem object is not zero, is not null pointer, this is not. Okay, yes. Um, we use uh, such simple memory model okay. because of structure of the kernel language. Okay. Uh, 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 the value of uh, C kernel language values are uh, strictly constrained. Yes. Uh, the, um, the variable and uh, the referencing of vari of a variable may be uh, values in the uh, kernel language. Uh, we give uh, this form using uh, translation. Yes, I see. Uh, from slide to kernel. Yes, I see. Okay. Translation from slide to C kernel allow us to give very simple forms of L values. I see kernel programs is similar to as I say, form. Yes. Um, yes. Um, and we uh, um, give a very um, um, uh, a simple forms of L values in the C kernel. And the R values in C kernel are also in very simple form. Yes. 
Uh, we may use only one operation in L value and uh, R value in C kernel. Yes. And thus uh, we may uh, um, create a table, a map yes. from uh, um, uh, variables uh, to uh, its addresses as uninterpreted constants and map from addresses to values. Yes. So, so thank you for this yeah, comment. Thank you. This clarifies a lot, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you. Tell me if you see the oops, okay. If you see the full screen slides. Yes, okay. I can. I can see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, my, my talk will be about uh, satisfiability mainly since model checking is closely related. Uh, for some extension of linear temporal logic that we were working with uh, Vladimir Zakharov for several years now, this is kind of a roundup talk. So we kind of finish a, a sequence of, of papers presented also on PSSVS in different years uh, about this logic. So I'll start, since this is a workshop about specification, I'll start readily from the specification motivation. I mean, Imagine we have a program which just sits here. And um, well, there are different views on how we uh, specify its behavior and what is that behavior. So for example, if the program is regarded just as a black box, then well, um, we only see the input and the output, which I label with C and H here for no reason, but well, we, have, we see the input and the output and we can specify the relationship between this input and output. So we can write some formula in some logic, doesn't matter which, um, such that uh, it represents some relationship between the pair. On the other hand, we can look inside the program and we, if we have the success, then we can model the program as, for example, a transition system as it, is, as it is usually done. And then we can look on the runs that this transition system generates. And then the behavior of the program begin, becomes like this set, the set of these runs. And we can specify the properties of such runs as sequences of states, for example. The runs can be finite, can be infinite. We'll be speaking about infinite runs in this presentation, but I will usually draw them as finite just to, to, to get of, rid of this redundant, I mean, dots and errors and keep the presentation clear. But we think of runs as infinite sequences and we can write some other formulae which um, specifies the properties of sequences. So we have these two approaches and uh, the natural question is, why don't we combine them? So imagine that we still have sequences, but now two sequences, one of inputs, there are also, there, there are also one of outputs and uh, we want to specify such a trace. So this trace, as we call it, is two sequences and they have, well, we want them to have some relation in between because it's a program that, create, that takes the input and creates the output. And well, um, yeah, so this is kind of a combined view. We have input and output and we have the temporal behavior in one, like in one model. So to formalize this a bit, I will write the upper sequence as a sequence of signals and the bottom sequence as a sequence of responses uh, where, well, since signals, input signals are something in like in intuition, something simple that comes to the input of the program, we will model them as just letters but the responses can be more complex and compound. So we will model them as words or some alphabet. So uh, signal is a letter, the response is a word. And we have these two sequences, which if we give it a closer look, uh, is a sequence of triangles. Yeah, one signal, series of responses. Another signal, another series of responses. And that, that kind of evolves over time. So we have these traces and how do we specify the properties of such traces then? 
So the important thing is that if we just want to specify the properties inside one triangle, then it, it is kind of straightforward. I mean, the triangles can be, well, there are, can be even infinite number of different triangles since the, the bottom is, is of unbounded length. But uh, still, what we are interested in here is the kind of the global relationship between the input and the output. So imagine that we have this long input sequence. Then in response to this long input sequence, we have this long output sequence. And when specifying the properties of traces, I want to specify this relationship between long sequences at the top and long sequences in the bottom. So if we just had local relationships inside triangles, then it would be just a one infinite word over an infinite alphabet. But now we have like these two words and actually two sequences and some relationship between them. So, okay, how do we specify them? So since tra traces are still sequences, we will use something to specify sequences. Yeah, so something based on linear temporal logic, for example, because it's a uh, well-studied and conventional way to do that. On the other hand, we have this finite words so of input and output, I mean, as parts of our long infinite word. And we want to establish some relationship between them and well, therefore we need to incorporate sets of finite words inside our formulae. So we have the temporal formulae, but we will use sets of finite words inside. And well, when it comes to computational realization, implementation, I mean, uh, we need some, well, um, tractable representations of these finite sets of words. So we will use regular languages and finite automata for this purpose uh, in order to keep things tractable. Yeah, so I will say regular language in what follows, but I really will mean a finite automaton because we need some computational representation. Okay, so let's start with the syntax. So we have this uh, temporal logic operators. Uh, we can all say that, for example, next time operator, I'll just uh, keep it simple here, but well, we can extend the number of operators if we want. Uh, so we have these operators and we use regular languages as parameters and we obtain this parameterized versions of temporal operators. This is the one place where the regular languages are used. And I will explain it in a minute, but there is also another place. So since uh, in classical LTL, we have propositional variables that are evalu evaluated at each moment of time. But uh, here we have like words as outputs. So instead of propositional variables, we will use uh, again regular languages as atomic formulae. Uh, so this is the second place where the regular languages are used. And the first place is as parameters and the semantics of it is a little bit more complicated. So let's see. In conventional temporal logic, uh, the temporal formula, for example, G, G phi means always phi. And it means that phi should be true everywhere on the trace, everywhere. But uh, using a parameter L, we can limit the scope of this temporal operator to the places where the input satisfies some particular pattern. So we parameterize the modality, we say GL phi, and that means whenever the input satisfies the parameter L, the formula phi must be satisfied. So for example, in this picture, L is all the input sequences ending with the black box. So we have phi satisfied in any such place. And for the white boxes, we don't care. And of course, L may be a little bit more complex. I mean, here we decide whether the input word is in L uh, just by looking at the last symbol, but we can make L a more, more interesting regular language and therefore express a more interesting property. Uh, so the thing to note here is that, well, since the input sequence is regarded as something like the sequence in charge, the control sequence, we really use our parameters only to rep to to describe the input sequence. Yeah, so L looks only here. The parameters are looking only to the upper sequence, while the formula phi itself may be compound temporal formula, and it will be evaluated on both on both runs, like on both sequences, so on the whole trace, starting from the point where we want to evaluate it. So this phi will be evaluated on this tail, and this phi will be evaluated on this tail. Okay, but the Parameters reason only about the, the upper sequence. Yeah, so uh, 
Another important thing is that the parameters are always read forward. So if we start to evaluate this formula GL5, for example, from the third position, then we will read the input words starting from the third position and we'll check if they comply with the parameters starting from the third position. Uh, for the formula FR5, if they are uh, evaluated on the fifth position, then we will read the words for the language R in the starting from the fifth position. So, yeah, so the parameters always look forward, while the basic formula, atomic formula, I mean, always look backward. So, that's a, that's a distinction. Yeah, so there are a couple of examples just to get more, you know, more experience with the logic. Uh, so this is, for example, the classical uh, what liveness formula, I suppose, but now parameterized. Yeah, so it says that whenever we have a black box, then there will be a moment where the white box would arise, and from that moment, the formula phi will be satisfied. And that, that, that there is, here is an example of trace that satisfies this requirement. Uh, making it other way around, the liveness, uh, the safety formula, sorry, uh, says that there will be a moment with a black box such that after it, each white box would give rise to a trace satisfying phi. Well, on this uh, picture, this part of the trace does not satisfy this example because the light white box does not have any phi here. But well, since the traces are infinite, maybe we can uh, come up with an extension of a trace which satisfies this formula. So we have this interaction between input and output. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, the classical question about any logic is, well, satisfiability problem. Yeah, so given phi, how do we decide whether there is a trace that, uh, that uh, well, on which phi is true? Yeah. Uh, so the lower bound is straightforward. We are using LTL, we are building our logic on top of LTL, and therefore, since LTL is already P space hard, well, I mean P space complete, but we are establishing lower bound now. We know that our logic is P space hard too. It's not, I mean, not that hard to see. Uh, but what about the upper bound? Uh, the upper bound, well, if we look at the classical algorithm for the temporal logic, uh, for the linear temporal logic, uh, it is based on translation to Buki automata. Yeah, so we take our formula, we construct a Buki automaton out of it. Uh, in classical construction, it has exponential number of states. And then we apply some graph analyzing algorithms on it uh, to establish whether it recognizes some trace. Uh, and um, so these algorithms are linear in the size of the automaton, therefore exponential in the size of the uh, original formula. And uh, well, we can do this and obtain a lean, uh, exponential time algorithm, or we can analyze the automaton on the fly using non-deterministic search, and uh, then we will have a polynomial space algorithm. So this is a classical situation. Uh, however, when the regular LTL was introduced in 2016, the construction that followed this approach in, with respect to our logic um, yield a little bit, well, much, I mean, much more, uh, much slower algorithm. So the Buki automaton built like straightforwardly from a regular LTL formula yields, it has double exponential uh, number of states. So there are two levels of exponentiations there. And also we have then um, an algorithm that analyzes this huge automaton in the linear time, it's still double exponential uh, in the size of the original formula. Or if we, we can, well, we can analyze the automaton again, uh, non-deterministically on the fly and reduce it to the exponential space, but still not very tractable. So why, why, is the, why is the automaton so big? Well, um, because if we look at a simple example of, of a formula given on the slide, um, we want to find, so it says that there will be some pattern of the input satisfying L such that from there, the formula GR5 would be satisfied. But it means that any time when we see the input 
corresponding to the parameter L, we, we need to check this formula GR5. And to check the formula GR5, we need to start from the point, for example, from the second point here, and check the formula phi any time when the parameter R is satisfied. So um, the, uh, I mean, the complication is that we have many, many, many formulas that we need to check simultaneously on the run. And in the case of classical LTL, it's okay. But here we have also automata in operation. And this automata can be in different states for different uh, instances of one subformula. So if we check one subformula of phi in, in the second position, it has some automata inside that may be in different states. And if we check the same subformula in a different position, the automata inside it can be in a different state. So uh, the uh, all in all, like the number of subformulae with respect to this automata inside becomes exponential. And therefore, well, since the states of Bouquet automata are subsets of sub formulae, then we have exponential number of subformulae and we have double exponential number of states. So this straightforward approach kind of yields double exponential number of states. Uh, well, what to do with that? Um, I have an idea. So if we have like too many automata, what do we do with them? We reduce the number. And uh, the automata we use are of two kinds. Uh, we have, first of all, we have atomic formula automata. Yeah, instead of propositional variable, variables in classical LTL, we have this atomic formula automata. And on the other hand, we have the operator parameters automata. And um, so first of all, to, to, to note is that, well, um, and we noted it already in 2018, that, well, we don't need really to keep all of our different automata for atomic formulae in the subformula state space. I mean, uh, we have one, for example, imagine we have an atomic formula. So it reads the output from the beginning of the time until the particular moment when we, we are analyzing it. And it can be true or false at that moment. So we, we can only keep one automaton for this subformula, which will read the, the output and decide at each point of time whether the subformula is true. I mean, not subformula, the atomic formula. Yeah. To decide whether the atomic formula is true. So we don't need to keep many automata. We just leave there only one automaton per each uh, atomic formula. And instead of putting it into the state space of the Bouquet automaton, we just make a Cartesian product with it, with all this automata for atomic formulae. And while well, we use this in 2018, but the other kind of automata, the ones that are representing operator parameters, was still there in the state space of uh, the Bouquet automaton. And we thought that, well, they still make this um, number of states to be double exponential. However, after a, well, a little bit of reconsideration and recomputation, uh, we found out that actually this is not the case. The, the real source of the, of the complexity was the, this uh, atomic formula automata, at automata and uh, the automata that I used to represent operator parameters, well, that number is not so big actually. If, you, if we compute it a little bit more carefully, we found out that, well, we, we have at least at, at most one per each subformula, and therefore in the state space, and I mean, therefore it yields polynomial number of subformula, and the state space of the BK automaton becomes just one exponential. Uh, however, in the paper that we submitted, well, we used some technique from uh, this seminal paper of Hendrickson and uh, Tiara Jan, and we actually obtained a little bit better result. Uh, so the number of subformula became nearly linear. So it's a little, a little optimization, but theoretically speaking, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the polynomial space up bound could be proved before. I don't know, we just, for some reason, we didn't see that. Uh, so yeah, we have this. Now, if, 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 if we implement uh, this technique with just exponential uh, size BK automaton, we readily have the satisfiability algorithm in this space. Like, it's kind of clear. Uh, if you have a formula built a BK automaton as usual, then analyze it on the fly non deterministically, you will obtain a 
polynomial size, polynomial space, non-deterministic algorithms, and then I use Savage theorem and, and obtain uh, by some metrics the deterministic uh, polynomial space algorithm. Yeah, so this kind of concludes the research. So we have the logic introduced in 2016, which was proved uh, in 2018 to be expressively equivalent to Duke automata, or more logically speaking, to this monadic second order theory of sequences. We have considered some branching time extensions as well, and today we kind of we came up with the with the full understanding of the complexity, it proved that it is space complete, and kind of this closes the discussion. So I actually I was very fast. It's less than twenty minutes now of me speaking. So maybe I I have a couple of a couple of more slides that I left here as a postscriptum, uh, if I have time for them. Uh, I think you have definitely have yes. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there is one thing I slipped in the in the discussion because well I said that we will. Um, analyze the key automaton on the fly. And it means that we generate a state. Yeah, we guess one state, we guess another state. Then we guess a letter, and then we check whether there exists a transition. And then we don't deterministically kind of switch to this next state. And if there is a pass in the automaton satisfying some properties, then on one of non-deterministic branches, we will find it. Like classical construction of non-deterministic graph searching algorithm. But now, a case, the letters are a little bit complex. I mean, the letters can be often bounded length themselves because the letter is actually this triangle, and triangle has, well, arbitrary size bottom. So, how do we really guess an unbounded triangle using only polynomial space? Well, actually, the answer to this question is quite, again, straightforward because, well, just we use some basic combinatorics with finite state automata, automata are finite. So uh, the thing is that if any formula is satisfiable, then it is true on some trace where triangles are bounded with this uh, two to the power of size of phi. So the triangles are not that big. So they are not arbitrary, they are bounded by some exponent. And then we can guess uh, them letter by letter, I mean, I mean, these letters in the bottom. Yeah, we can guess these letters in the bottom one by one and count the number we guessed. And then, since the number is at most exponential, the number of letters uh, there is um, can be counted on polynomial space, and we are okay with that. So, this is not that, I mean, th th that complicated. And I wouldn't uh, point this out to the slides unless, well, we can ask here a little bit. Uh, a little natural question um, like, okay, we have this exponential bound on the size of triangles. Can we do better? Can we, can we consider much shorter, well, not traces actually, much shorter triangles. Traces are infinite, but triangles, can they be smaller? Can they be polynomial? Can we satisfy any satisfiable formula using only polynomial sized triangles? Of course, this wouldn't help us to improve the algorithm theoretically because, well, they, we have this, polynomial space lower bound and well will be there. it will be there but just just as a question of interest like can we can can we work with the shorter triangles and the answer is no and uh, we were able to come up with a series of formulae such that each of them is satisfiable but there is a lower bound on the size of a triangle in the in in the satisfying trace and this lower bound is well two to the power of square root of phi. So not exponential per se, but kind of super polynomial still. And it is proved by using some, uh, well, simple, maybe not so simple properties of prime, prime numbers. Uh, I even had to, took, uh, to, 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 to take some lemmas from the uh, paper by Gilbert, uh, from the paper by Hardy uh, from the previous century. But uh, well, why is it it seems interesting to me is that well there is there are many connections many known connections between automata theory and number theory out there and since our logic uses automata then maybe we can kind of look into how it is as, as, as how our formulae are connected to number theory maybe so we used some prime number 
numbers properties to prove this lower bound, maybe we can do more. Maybe we can like found other connections. This is just kind of a romantic dream, but uh, I thought that if I, I, had, I had the time, I wanted to kind of to share it with you. Yeah, so I'll now return to the slide with the, with the conclusion. And kind of, I'm, I'm done. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please ask them. Thank you very much, Anton. You presented perfect in time with, the, with the extra slides in a very calm and effective manner without, without rush. So everything was fitting perfectly. I have a question for you, but maybe are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, there is Nikolai. Please, thank, Nikolai. Uh, thank you very, very much, Manuel. Uh, very naive question, very naive indeed. So uh, basically, Buhier automata is, well, basically de facto the main at, uh, automata uh, used for, well, uh, for proving uh, decidability or model checking properties of uh, different temp temporal logics. Do you feel sometimes that Buhier automata are too narrow or maybe a little bit, or, li or maybe should be Modify it a little bit, something like this, anytime. Well, uh, do you understand the question? It is, yeah, not, think, it is not exactly about what did you present because it is yeah, it, yeah. it is very hard to ask technical question, but very interesting for me indeed. Well, uh, I would say that uh, so far, uh, Wiki Automata were kind of um, enough for every purpose, uh, for, for, for every purpose, I mean, that we had, like uh, every modification of uh, temporal logic that we analyzed with, uh, with Vladimir Anatolich uh, was like kind of uh, reducible to Buki Automata and we didn't need any kind of ex enhancement of their power as of so far. Well, so, 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 I can't really say that I, I needed any modification. Maybe in terms of limiting their power to obtain some maybe a little bit more um, more tractable version. But well, uh, in fact, th this logic is is equivalent to Buki automata. So if we, if if you take any, I mean, in expressive power, so any any limitation of the power of Buki automata would result in, in a situation when we can't translate our formula to, to, to that to that to that parameter. So I'm afraid that kind of <laughs> I can't say anything that, 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 that I feel anything new about about this. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe question? short question will be enough. Uh, we are happy with this class. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let, uh, let's see, let me see if there is any other question in the audience. Seems not. I wanted to ask you something, uh, well, basically, in par partially, you already answered, and uh, not only today, but also in your previous paper, but it comes very natural to consider LTL, no? because the semantic is a bit more manageable, I think, but you considered also CTL, no? you consider also the branching time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this requires some kind of, I suppose, major uh, change of the, of the time model and major change of the semantics. But you started with LTL, very simple question. You started with LTL because it's kind of not more natural and simpler, and then you extend the CTL. This is classic uh, approach, you know, that everyone is following, or I missed some maybe particular or deeper reason. Well, yes, I think you're right. I mean, uh, we were considering programs generating these double traces and kind of Double traces are sequences and linear things. So we we started with uh, using LTL. Uh, we had yeah we had a couple of papers uh, about the branching time versions, either the uh, kind of the simple branching time like CTL and the the full branching time. Uh, and for the full branching time, we still have the exponential space satisfiability algorithm. So I don't know if it can be improved really to to the polynomial space. So 
yeah, uh, things are more complex for, for, for the branching time. But yeah, the answer is yes. We used LTL here because it's just more natural to, more to natural. operate. You didn't, for, you didn't forget. Did you set aside the research about uh, the branching time or you, is something that is still in your agenda somehow? Well, uh, well. Oh, so you can say no. Time no time it's, being, it's kind of. Um, yeah, for the, for the time being, it's kind of hard. That, yeah, I, okay. I kind of. No, uh, I finished my master's program, and I, I don't know if I will return. But there are <laughs> there are some questions because there are kind of adjustments on the even even for LTL. You can, for example, they have this simple algorithm. I think, and I thought about this morning, uh, because we read the output from the start of time to to to, to the moment, like, uh, and the, and therefore we can we can keep only one. Only one copy of of, 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 of um, the atomic formula atomicity. But what if we read it not from the beginning? But if, what what if the kind of the, the the scope of of the atomic formula would would vary over the trace? Then it may be become a little bit more complicated. So there are things to be to be done, and there are things to think about, even in the case of classical LTL, even mm -hmm. before going to, to CTL. OK, I hope that you will have opportunity and time maybe in the future to, to explore a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. It was very nice. It was very present, very, very polished manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. So we have a second talk. This is the last regular talk for today, because then we will have a more talk, but short talk. So this is a talk for half an hour. Then there will be talks for uh, 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, now it's a challenging because I can. Uh, it's a multinational team, so I can make all the accent wrong in one sentence. <laughs> so Alexander Bolotov, Alex Abwin Yepes, but I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Pak Vilucho and uh, Montserrat Hermo. What? How many mistakes I did? I hope maximum four <laughs> in the pronunciation. <laughs> Who is the speaker? Already, you are already online, right? I can see your screen. Please, please start. Thank you very much. Alexander, please. Can you hear me, Alexander? Anyone can hear me? Uh, I hear you. Uh, we can yeah. hear you, but again, problem with uh, communication uh, connection, I believe. He's online. Me. Ah, all right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Let me do it again now. Thank you. Please. You can start. I think you should be able to see the screen now, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. And hear me well? Is good? Well, yes. Everything is perfect for now. You never know, but for now it's perfect. So let me just move to the full screen. OK. So uh, yes, I'm presenting this work from multinational team. Apparently, there were no mistakes in pronunciation of the names, <laughs> which, is, which is great. Super. Uh, and uh, well, because it's multinational team, we still speak English between each other. So that's quite, yeah, that's quite, that's quite common. Um, well, I was delegated the right to give this talk, so I take I take that pleasure, and uh, I'm going to <clears throat> describe our work on the uh, way uh, to develop uh, an approach to complement tabular based satisfiability algorithms for now branching time logic CTL uh, by certifying sequence uh, proofs and extracting models. So just to let you know what I'm going to talk about, if you don't object to that. So I will definitely introduce the framework, maybe just briefly, because we've got a really nice talk before me that gave good insight on, on the linear time framework. So I have to move on with the branching time. Um, I will speak about the system, of course, the duality between the technical uh, systems we are using in this framework. Uh, we'll concentrate on, on the alg algorithms, describe the experimental results, and surely try to draw some uh, conclusions. Right. Uh, well, just, just to recall that 
well, little philosophy about time here. Uh, I think very, I like that citation from Bill Keith, especially with our uh, pandemic around us. So, so you can read it from the, from, from the slide. Um, uh, the time picture, which, well, is normally used for this type of work, unless we dig deeper to the runtime problems, is to develop the past and the future as discrete sequences of states, isomorphic to natural numbers, uh, with the assumption that the past is linear uh, and finite, and therefore we just concentrate on the future time operators. So we don't need we don't need to, but we may want to introduce past time operators. Though the future could be very, of course, well, we can end up with the linear logic as we saw in the previous talk, tackling propositional linear time temporal logic, or we can add up uh, the branching parameters. So we don't have any restrictions of the number of the successor states. Now, that I tried to present our diagram schema, uh, our, our framework in forms of the diagram here. Uh, so the general framework we are working in is the approach to verify the system specification. And here we are trying to uh, uh, show that it's quite an important idea to use sort of same method to provide both certificates for the verification and counter example. And for this, we develop a dual sort of framework where sequent calculi is used to provide formal proofs in the, in, 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 in the formulation of the logic. And uh, on the other hand, the tablet technique, and specifically we concentrate on one past tablet, and I'll speak about this in a second, that would give us a chance to uh, build models which are extractable from open branches. The language which we will use for formulation of the, well, that quite classical branching time candidate to consider, CTL, uh, is without any restrictions on the temporal operation. So we sort of use the full set and uh, uh, just for the, for the reasons of expressivity, if you want. Uh, just to remind you that uh, in CTL, anticipating a little bit the future, uh, we have very dedicated restrictions on the syntax, uh, which demand for every temporal operator to be uh, preceded by the path one. So a little bit, little bit of the uh, semantics, just again spitting things ahead. So this is the linear, this is the linear interpretation of temporal operations, right? Next time would we'll give you this the evaluation of the argument of the operator in the next stage sometime would be a promise, right? For the argument P to occur at some stage in the future. Uh, always P would mean that it's invariant, P is invariant, so it would occur in every state on some sequence, but remember it's linear time. And, and, and uh, until P until Q is the operation which requires the Q argument to occur in the future and be to be true until that time. Yeah, so very, very intuitive semantics. So people like temporal logic because it gives quite intuitive semantics based on English look at the world. Uh, yeah, so in CTL, as I said, we are restricting syntax uh, by considering uh, well-formed formulae that are that are state formulae and state formulae are formed by combining temporal operations and quantification of a path. So as, as I think familiar for uh, everybody, the models for branching time would be trees. So we need to quantify over path in some sense. 
and we introduce quantifiers such as existing paths or for any path we're considering. And uh, following the restriction for every temple operated to be preceded by path quantifier, we end up with formula. Now here I give well quite a complex formula from the first view for CTL and uh, I will give a little bit of insight into it in the future but just pay attention here that we actually have a, an obvious uh, expression here of the restriction of CTL right so every temple operation here the diamond the eventuality operator is preceded by for all quantifier etc so we're following the syntax here and just to anticipate the evaluation of the formula look at the structure of this formula you will see that the first part would give you the promise for p to be eventually true along any path of your tree right for all, for all paths eventually p the second formula apparently gives you potential to have a loop in not p right because you can see the structure such that as soon as you satisfy r somewhere along the tree wherever you take the move from that state you would have the successor state where you would have got not p and r again so you see every success of that state where not r is true would have not p and then and then r again so it's sort of a recursive argument and then you expand the expand the reasoning and you end up with a path in which not p will be true I'll come back to that formula later. So on the other hand, one important observation for, well, I think for everybody who is dealing with deductive methods for, uh, for the logics and in general for reasoning uh, is to understand the, what, we, what is called in temporal logic history, our general, our general approach to the uh, sort of variation of the models here. And uh, in case of sort of classical CTL, we have all three closure properties on the paths. Uh, I wrote the definitions here. Well, it's not the definition, but just informal explanation of what they are. And we are talking about we are talking about suffix closure, meaning that every suffix of a path belongs to the set of paths. Fusion closure means that you would have a chance to follow any computation from some point on. So you can concatenate the prefix and the suffix if you want. And one of the important properties is limit closure, uh, which actually affects quite seriously the way how the reasoning in branching time works and affects many properties as well. And that property is probably quite natural because without it, you would have different types of, of models like bundles, for example, and I try to make my best uh, to show that limit closure property on this diagram, right? So using colors, right? So the idea is that you, you can go along the yellow path first, so you can see that sort of route through the tree. Then you take the same prefix, but you continue along yellow path, then you continue along green path, blue path, etc. And then you can if you have a limit closure property in formula, it means that you actually have a path that is a limit of all this path which you just introduced, right? In other words, you can concatenate uh, all these colored pref prefixes and you end up with a path which is considered as a limit closure. And, and that path belongs to the set of paths in the middle. I don't want to give the full uh, definition of the availability. Uh, 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 for uh, formula in CTL. So we define la label critical structure in the standard way, uh, just to say that uh, the only probably feature of this representation in the paper is that we are uh, considering a non-empty non set of initial states. Well, often, often, of, often it's only one initial state, but it does make harm and quite useful often to, to have no limit on the number of the initial states. Uh, well, rather than giving the formal semantics, I'll give you a few pictures to understand how things work in branching time. So this diagram shows the satisfiability of the formula 
exists a path from that point where I wrote that formula is a label on which eventually not P happens. And you can see uh, that is the that is the case. So we've got next state where where not P is true. Now always means that well you have an invariant, right? So wherever you go from the common from the given state, you end up with the argument of that modality everywhere expanded over the chain, right? So not P is invariant. Uh, so this little diagram shows uh, an inconsistent set. So on the one hand, we've got the statement that P is promised to be true at some stage along some path. And I colored that path in red, you can see in the middle. So we reach the state where P is true eventually. And on the other hand, we've got the uh, invariant not P. And of course we would hit the, the, the state which is already labeled with P and we've got an inconsistency here, yeah? So I think it's quite intuitive. And uh, well, people like CTL, we like CTL, everybody likes CTL, why? Because it's a very natural way of, uh, in a sense, right? Very natural way of uh, moving along the uh, tree structure step by step if you want, right? And that's the feature of the, uh, of the syntax of CTL where every, every temporal operator required to be prefixed by the path quantifier. So that allows that, that traveling along the tree step by step which is quite useful, of course. Um, now, finally, the until, which is quite an important operation in uh, terms of specification here in the scope of exist path quantifier would give us a chance to, uh, well, draw again that green path where you can see Q is eventually true and uh, until that time, P is right? So that's the until operation, the scope of there exists. So I'm back now to that formula, which I gave you as, uh, as an insight of the CTL structure. And uh, uh, I do emphasize this introduction of the informal things because I think after this, it will become very clear uh, how the tabular system works and how the sequence system works. Uh, just to come back to the uh, claim, which I made that this set of, of formula is unsatisfiable. So you can see that uh, the formula which has the potential loop requires the constraint R to be true at some stage, right? And as soon as you satisfy R, you trigger the, the looping sort of part of it. So you know that every success of that state where R is true would, would, would have not P and R. So R again, and then you, you trigger the recursion, right? And every state will every state along that path, which you definitely end up due to limit closure property, would have not p. So that first constraint would have a loop in not p. And then to trigger that loop, we have to make R happening. And that's the second constraint because it's the promise until operation promises that not p and R happen. So therefore, R would happen. And from that point on, we've got a loop in not p. And then of course the first the first formula for all pass diamond P, which is for all pass eventually P would require P to be true along every pass, including that one where we found the loop. So we've got the problem here and therefore the formula is unsatisfied. We'll come till tomorrow. So I think it gives quite good intuition behind the, the abstraction. So now, well, time came to speak about the two methods that are dual and we, we are talking about in our paper on the one hand, we've got the tableau, and on the, on the other hand, we've got the sequence calculus. The tableau is presented as a labeled graph, normally with alpha beta rules. Alpha rules would not split the construction. They just give the satisfiability conditions given some assumptions, and beta rules would split depending on the, on the input, of course. Uh, the temporal uh, rules for the tableau are based on the fixed point characterization of CTL structures. So for example, box, similarly to linear time, of course, box always formula, right? So the first fixed point equation here says that if you've got invariant phi, so phi is an invariant in every path, then it should happen now, right? And then wherever you go in the successor state, you would repeat 
that constraint. And you and you got that recursion forever. So you define uh, for all always as an, an invariant property as a, as based on the fixed point characterization. And uh, the rules for the tableau. So I gave you just two examples here. Uh, would follow that equation. So you see the for all always phi rule would require to stay to stay on board on the one branch of the of the tablet while if you use the minimal fixed point which is until you have a you have a beta rule so you split the construction uh, now one of the important rules in in our approach of the one pass tablet and i will speak about the essence of one pass tablet in a second uh, so one of the features is the next time operation so we need to deal with the next time formula they allow us to jump when we, uh, if anybody familiar with the tablet for, for well, classical rule for paper for, for tablet construction, we sort of move along the construction of the graph uh, building states, right? So we build a state and the state is the situation when you evaluate formulae which have next, so you know what's happening next time or literals, right? So that's the, that's the input for the, for the for building states along the way. And we define such a rule which would actually split the tableau into uh, the, the branch into and or part. And this is the essence of the tableau construction. Now, the specifics of our method is that we are dealing with one pass tableau. And the idea is that we don't, we're not going to the uh, standard check uh, of the satisfaction of eventualities as it's happening in the two pass structure so instead we are having the mechanism how to deal with the tableau in one go in one pass and the mechanism to cope with this is based on the concept of a context and the concept is the context is something very simple actually right is the set of formula that accompany the selected eventuality which we are reasoning about so for example if you've got here in the last line the no, the State the node of the tabular uh, with the labels exists p until q and p, and we consider eventuality until here, then it would occur in the context of p. So the context of eventuality is p. And what we need to do, we need to develop clever mechanism how to deal with the context to preserve the satisfiability of the construction. And uh, little example of the way how the tabular expands. So you can see uh, we start with applying the beta rule is until eventuality. Uh, we construct a pre-state, as I said, because we end up at the second node of the right branch. We have all information to build the pre-state, right? So the literal or next time forming the scope of the quantifier. So we can construct the pre-state and then we expand the pre-state following the, again, rules that correspond to fixed point characterization. One of the branches give us a model, here the other one gives a contradiction. Okay. So it's a very simple example. I don't want to give complex examples. Now, these are the rules for the tableau. You can see them on the top. So we've got the beta rules dealing with disjunction, uh, with diamond, with eventuality operation, and we've got uh, alpha rule dealing with the box always operation. Uh, preceded by quantifier and a beta rule dealing with until. So they're based on the equations that I introduced. And the important stuff is that we can generate the rules for the sequence calculus, simply sort of simulating that reasoning in the tablet if you want. And you can see the uh, bottom part of the slide introduces exactly this rules that, that virtually simulate the uh, corresponding rules of the, of the tableau. Uh, one little exception is the next rule. And if you remember, I mentioned that the next time, the next rule, the next state rule allows to move from the state to a free state construction in the tabular. And we end up with, with end successes. So we build a part of the graph, which is an end tree. And therefore, when we, when we verify some conditions, we have to make sure that that we deal with the appropriate setting here. So we are talking about something happening along, say, all n successes, right? Because they are they are linked sort of in a in a bunch, if you want. 
uh, and the essence of the truth in the table is given here. So all we do, we generate as many n successes as existential quantifies in the given input to the to the rule, right? And we repeat uh, and and we repeat this process when we build the uh, expansion of the of the tableau. And that's the way how we generate the pre-state. A similar rule for the next state, the next state rule for the sequence calculus. Uh, simulating the reasoning, but remember that in the sequent calculus case, we are we, we so don't, don't don't need to dive into the construction of the end tree. That's what. Well. Now in the tabular case, uh, uh, we have, for example, this situation, and that fragment of the tabular construction gives the intuition how things work. So you can see the second line will give a chance. To move to the two next successes and successes because we've got two existential quantifiers here and we generate two and successes in the bottom line and this is the end the start of the end or tree uh, and as i said one of the crucial concepts in in the tablet construction is the context what it does i have to repeat it that's important it does play the role of a trigger to fulfill eventualities as soon as possible and that's very important feature that guarantees that we can deal with the input in one one. Now I've got a few examples if anybody's interested, and I'm skipping this. Uh, they are quite complex how to generate proof for the given, given input. Uh, you can just have the flavor of this looking at this slide. Uh, I don't want to go into details here. If you have questions, I will come to details. And uh, we have a similar situation with the with the sequence calculator proof uh, when we speak about the closed tablet, right? So remember, the tableau in our approach would give us models. The sequence calculus would give us would give us the 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 proof. And that's the way how we think the unified approach may work today. So the implementation of this approach. Uh, was done in the Daphne language, but the prototype we worked with uh, uh, the benchmarks and particularly we were trying to compare the approach with the one used by Gold Group. Uh, and uh, well, in a sense, we've got some encouraging results, both without and with model checking and proof construction. Uh, we've got some, some extra time to generate certificates here. And uh, our nearest future plan is to compare this approach with the tablet based procedures with other, other, other tablet based procedures, for example, those by the Gauss group. So, just to repeat, the idea was to, to develop a, a kind of unified approach to deal with the, with the generation of models and uh, count examples and proofs. And we believe that having sort of dual Tableau and uh, sequence calculus is a good way here, here to give us quite an efficient approach to reason about the framework. Uh, well, it's more work to be done, of course, such as the check of the proof certificates, the graphical representation of the models, and formal verification of the correctness of the algorithm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Let me switch on the video. It's a bit. It's a bit dark. Thank you. I think we have time uh, probably for one uh, relatively short question, if there is any. Nikolai, please. Thank you. Uh, very simple question, but nevertheless, why you would like to use Isabel Hall for checking proof certificates? It seems to me that any proof checker can be used. Why in particular this, this one? No, no, it's not. It's not. I don't think it's it 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 is any specific uh, sort of emphasis on Isabel Hall. But we have to start with something, right? Basically, it was my assumption. Basically, it yeah, was yeah. my assumption. But you stress it in your slides. Mm -hmm. All right, right. Yes, yes. So I want just another quick observation. You have a slide on benchmarking, right? I think it's second last slide, just before this one, probably. Yeah. Experimenter, is, uh, yeah. So, can you elaborate a little bit uh, more? I, because I, I think I missed this point. So, what 
what did you get uh, after the experiments? Well, we, 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 what we need to do is to, is, uh, and the idea was to un understand uh, how the system works on the famous benchmarks, right? So we, we, take, we take as an example those that are available, right? Uh, by Rajiv Gold's group, who mm -hmm. was one of the uh, authors of several tablet constructions, right? For example, for, for branching time logics. And, uh, and uh, uh, we're evaluating the results of the our performance here. And uh, uh, the, the, well, elaboration would mean that uh, in, in comparing to, 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 our, to, to that work, we would have to, to come up with extra time, right? For the mm -hmm. So that's, that's the output, right? I think that's mm -hmm. right? So that's yeah. the extra time which is needed, 21% max at the time, right? Uh, so we will see. We, we will see what, what 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 we can do about it, and whether there are techniques that can be can be applied to tune. But of course, it's 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 CTL. Remember, CTL is 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 a good candidate. We've got this this uh, techniques extended for richer logics than CTL, but the complexity is a little bit frightening there. So we need <laughs> so we need to think whether whether we can end up with some feasible sort of solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In I understand. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for the very informative talk. Thank you very much. We are uh, we are in time. And next uh, talk is. Um, I stop sharing now. Yes, please. So we have a next talk. Now we have a three three talks that are short talks, so fifteen minutes, including questions. The next one presented by Tan Hai Tran with uh, Igor Konov and Josef Wider. Model checking of skins at atomic multicast protocol. So I think the speaker is already online. Yes, I am. Hi. Uh, and uh, good afternoon. You can share your screen. Yeah, thanks. And start. Thank you. Okay. So I hope that uh, everyone now can see my screen. And thanks for the introduction. Yes. So now uh, I'm going to present my uh, paper for the checking of skins atomic multicast protocol. This is John work uh, with Igor Konov and Joseph Peter from Informal Systems. And first, let me give you some ideas about multicast protocol. In this system, there are many processes and communication channels. Processes can communicate with each other by receiving and sending messages. Importantly, a message can be sent to a group of processes. For example, here, you can see that message M1 is sent to two processes, P2 and P1, and processes that need to make an agreement on how to order multicast. Other interesting properties are integrity, validity, and so on. I will give you more details about these properties later. And the skin multicast protocol is a well-known one in the failure-free environment. This algorithm requires a total order of process IDs. Moreover, every process has its own local blocks. And the skin property should preserve the following properties. Validity, integrity, the ordering and termination. Every multicast protocol that certifies the mentioned properties are called atomic one. And why the skin algorithm is important, there is no verification of this algorithm. And in this paper, we want to verify the skin protocol by applying order checking. And now we want to check the following properties. The first property is termination. This is a litmus property. If M is multicast by a process, then every RSC of M eventually delivers M. The second property is integrity. This property refers to that every process delivers a message at most one. 
and then we have validity. If P delivers M, then M was multicast before, and P is an RSC of M. And the last one is the most challenging one, a total order. There exists a total order less than on all messages that are multicast in an execution trace such that if B delivers M, then for every message M prime less than M, such that P is an arrest of M prime, then B delivers M prime before M. Now I give you one example to demonstrate how the skin algorithm works. In this example, there are three processes and one message. Message M1 is sent to P1 and P2. And let's see what happens. After receiving a message, uh, let's look at the process P2. After receiving message M1, P2 proposed a local timestamp for M1. You can see that we have LTS, P2, M1, and T2. And a similar thing happens in P1. So we also have a local timestamp of P1 for M1, LTS, P1, M1, T1. And now P2 sends its local timestamp to P1. And after receiving the local timestamp from P2, now P1 has on local timestamp for M1. Then P1 commits message M1 and it calculates the global timestamp for M1. So here we have GTS P1 M1 TS1. And the global timestamp is the maximum local timestamp for message. And then P1 synchronize its clock by using the global timestamp of M1. And finally, it checks the condition in the central. For our message M uh, that proposed before, if the global timestamp for M1 is less than its proposed local timestamp for M, okay, this track, uh, MP1 checks this condition. And because this condition satisfies, so then P1 delivers M1. And later, P1 sends its local timestamp to P2. And similar things happen in P2. And now you can see that we have uh, two global timestamps, one from P2 and one from P1. And the important thing, to these global timestamps, they are equal. And this is how we construct a total order of messages. Okay, and this is the pseudocode. This pseudocode describes exactly what I said before. And to verify the scheme protocol, we, speci we specify it in the specification language, TLI plus, and then we use two model checkers, TOC and Appalachia. TOC is an implicit state model checker and Appalachia is a simulated model checker. You can download the tools from the provided links on the web, on the link, on the slide, sorry, on the slide. And now I'm talking about the experiments. The experiment is of checking integrity, safe validity, and total order, the safety properties. And the first column N is the number of made processes. And column C, refers to the mass value of the clocks and messages are uh, multicast messages. And uh, we have P1 arrow, a set of P1, M1. It means that a uh, process P1 multicast message M1 to a group of processes P1. And here you can see that TLC is better than Apache. However, the last case is very challenging for both model checkers. They cannot check the last case. And the next experiment is of checking inductive invariance. Here we check three inductive invariance, I in, B in, and uh, T O in. This inductive invariance implies 
the safety properties, integrity, validity, and total order, respectively. And therefore, checking inductive invariance is another way to prove the safety properties. Here you can see that Appalachia is faster than DLC. Interestingly, uh, for the last guy, now Appalachia can check the inductive invariant for the uh, integrity property. And the last experiment is of checking termination. And here you can see that uh, we should use TLC because now Appalachia doesn't support if need checking. Okay, so we're going to the end. Uh, in this talk, I have presented how to verify the scheme protocol by applying model checkings, model checking. And our experiment shows that uh, for leaflet checking, we should use TOC. However, Appalachia is better than TOC in checking inductive invariance. And for safety properties, we can use uh, home model checkers, TOC and Appalachia to check them. And for future work, we would like to verify all instances of the scheme protocol. Another direction is to verify algorithms that preserve a partial order and the message delivery. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for the clean presentation. We probably there are some questions, but while people are raising their hands virtually, I wanted to ask you, did you think about approach, a similar approach applied to algorithms like, for example, Paxos, which is probably slightly com even more complicated. Uh, I think we can use uh, the approach I presented here to verify all the algorithms with a partial order on message delivery. But uh, for the test cases, it depends on how many processes uh, and uh, and the maximum value of the clocks we want to use. For example, here you can see that uh, uh, our test case uh, have uh, three processes, and it can check uh, the model checker can check for some cases, but cannot. Then it starts for some cases. So then it depends on the value of par parameters. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I understand. Uh, there is uh, uh, Nikolai, Nikolai, that wants to ask a question. Please, Nikolai. Yes, as usual, it's me. Uh, could you please move me and to, you. <laughs> could you please move to slide where you specify properties to, that you are going to verify? Uh, honestly, uh, I don't understand how from this pro, uh, do you uh, does this does this collection guarantee uh, delivery? So integrity uh, just guarantees that at most once, at most once. Yes. So uh, maybe some messages can be lost. So I was pretty much int intrigued by this uh, question and uh, still would like to know. Ah, okay. Because uh, the skin property, I mean, the skin algorithm is designed for the failure-free environment. So that message cannot be lost. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for the question. Thank you for the for the talk. Thank you very much. So let's move to the second uh, uh, short talk. Second short talk for fifteen. So now we are two minutes ahead. Incredible. <laughs> uh, it's good, no? So Julio Ches. Uh, well, this is difficult. Julio Cesar uh, Caraskel, uh, validating real behavior of agent in trading system using nested petri nets. So you are, can you, you are online? Yes, we can hear you very well. Uh, yes, so you can share your video. You have one extra minute if you want, because we are at. <laughs> Wonderful, the extra minute. Thank you. Uh, I hope that you see the screen too. Yes, I can see. Perfect. Can so, see. Good afternoon. Uh, I am a researcher from HSC in Moscow, the Laboratory of Process Aware Information Systems, PICE Lab. And our work is to validate trading systems using informal models, petri nets. First of all, what is a trading system? 
So we can define it like a multi-agent system where we have agents that submit buy and sell orders to a platform to trade securities. For example, we could have Ben, he wants to, uh, to buy 40 stocks of the, of the, of the security Rosneft at a, at a price of $20. And we have another trader that wants to sell them. And then they submit these orders to the system, to the platform, and the platform, uh, the platform performs automatic matching of these orders. What is our research about? We validate, we want to check if the runs of the, the real system, as we observe in an even log, comply with the system specification. So we have a documentation and we build, based on the documentation, a pattern at a formal model that describes how the system should have uh, behaved. So we compare even log with the model and we produce as output using conformant checking a, a list of deviations indicating where the system as observed in the log violated the model. In this talk, so we are going to focus on a, a special component of the system, which is a, the communication of the agents with the platform. And for this, we use nested patterns. So in the presentation, I will explain very briefly what's the model, how is the log, and how do we compare it, how this conformant method works. So before introducing the model, I take as a very small example, a, a subset of the financial information exchange protocol, FIX, which is used in, in real life trading systems. A, how does it work? For example, the market opens. So the ring is bell, saying to the agents that they can log in the platform, and that platform starts to granting these logins. Then agents can start, once they are logged in, they can start to create orders and to send them. Also, there can be messages related to the connection. So for example, after some time, if the agent hasn't done any activity, the platform send a test request saying, hey, are you alive? Is the connection still is on? And the agent most responds with a heartbeat. Eventually, the, the ring bells again, saying that the processes of the agents should terminate because the, the, the trading day, it's finishing for today. So there should be a logout procedure at the end. Now, how to model this with Petrinet? In Petrinet, we have, it's a bipartite graph. We have two kinds of nodes, the transitions in boxes, model the activities. So what an agent can do? The places are the local states and the, we have tokens that can, can be stored in the places that models the, the control thread of the process. Also, the models are executable. And we say that the firing of a transition removes tokens from the input places to and produce them in output places. For, for example, so when an agent requests login, we take a token from the source and it's placed in the, so, and it's produced a token in the waiting state. And these can be abstractly interpreted like it's waiting response from the system to log in. Now, the idea of nested patterns is that we have a, a hierarchical model where we have a main model called the system net SN and the net and the tokens are now patterns. And in this way, we can model individual agents. This model has a, a special semantics for execution. So we still have a, individual execution of every individual agent. So for example, for Ben, the, the, the rule of the firing of firing works just as I explained it. But also we can have simultaneous uh, execution. For example, if this, if this transition executes and it's labeled with a, what we call a synchronization label, and in Ben also there is an enabled transition with such a label and Ben is involved in this firing, then we have a simultaneous uh, firing where the token BEM has passed to online users and the, the, the firing in BEM in the transition login has consumed the token from waiting. And we have now two tokens that this can, this denotes that BEM is now ready to make to perform session related activities for the management of the connection and also application messages. For example, he is ready to create orders. And a transfer step 
that it means that it's a execution from the side of the system. For example, the system sends a test request. He sets in his records that now Ben is, is idle and he will wait for a, uh, an execution of Ben that he will send a hardware. So you see that we changed the state in the platform, but not in the agent. And the example of the log I here provide below. So we have four events. So we have a trace corresponds to a round of the system with four events. In the first event, we have that Ben created an order. So this is individual action from the side of the agent. In the second event, we have that Ben created an order. So sorry, that sent an order and also that the system has received it. Then we have a request just from the system. So this can be seen as a transfer a step. And finally, we have in one event, the execution of both. Ben sent a heartbeat and the trading is acknowledging the heartbeat. How the method works. In the first phase, we, so the idea is to replace this trace on the nested petrinets and to find deviations where the system that's observed in Sigma has violated the model. So first of all, we insert the agents that we have observed in a trace. In this case, there is just one Ben in the source places of the model according to its type. So we assume that we have a matching that for one identifier of an agent, we have one workflow, one special class of workflow, Petrinet, for such an agent. Then the phase two, it's simple. It's just to execute the model as indicated in each event. So we look that the first event is saying, hey, we need to execute in Ben agent, create an order. But what happened that the, the, the Transition create order is not enabled. We don't have we don't have this 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 place market. So we need we have found a deviation, and also we need we need to force somehow to continue the replay to to find further deviations in the trace. So we are going to force the model to execute in the way that the in the way that the system in real life has done. So we mark a token here and we continue the execution. Look that also we have. Uh, market this deviation. Another example. So in this case, we need to receive an order from Ben who is going to send it. In this case, uh, the place online users, Ben is not here in this place. It's in the place source users. This is the problem that in the trace, Ben did not manage the login, did not carry out the login procedure. So he somehow, for example, via backdoor, entered to the system to create an order. So in order again to force this in the system, that we come the idea of transferring, of moving this token, this that represents an individual agent from the soul, from this place to this one. And we trace, we mark this trail that represents this line that represents this, this deviation from the agent. So he did not carry out the load on, but he, for example, via backdoor, entered to the state of online users and so on and so forth for the next event. So we, if we cannot execute the, the model, we perform a certain strategy. So we can insert missing tokens or to make a movement of tokens that we call jumps. The final phase, is to check proper termination. So we are modeling processes and validating processes. So we would like that at the end of the trace, for example, the trading day finished, are the sinks of these models market. So then after the execution, arrive to his final state where the sink is market. The platform of the trading arrive to the final state where the sink is market. So we need to check this. We see that they are not. So the process finished without the logout procedure, without the logout mechanism. So also these deviations are registered. Also, we have a fitness metrics uh, because of time. I'm not going deeper. We put return if someone is interested. That the idea is simple. It's just to take, is to take these counters of how many tokens we have consumed, produced, these jumps and transfers in the system, and we perform. Uh, we calculate, we use them to create a formula that tell us the system overall compliance as observed in the trace with respect to the model. So how well 
the system as observed in the trace has complied with what we have written in the model. Uh, some remarks here. Uh, this, this technique of the replaying in the system net is based on an earlier work that we have done with colored nets, another model where the tokens represent individual identifiers and the replay in the net tokens follow the standard approach that it can be found in the process mining literature. We have implemented this in Python and this is the implementation is based on the snakes, which is a powerful library for a simulation of high level Petri nets. A, another remarks, where to position our work? A, first of all, I wanted to say that the choice of a Petri net, so we have this class of Petri net extension, a nested Petri net, but in general, a, what Petri net extension to use it highly depends on the system component and the access that we want to validate. For example, in other two works, we have used colored Petri nets because we are not interested in checking communication of the agents with the platform, but rather how the inside the trading platform is managing the, the orders. And colored Petri nets provide a semantics for doing that. So we leverage the semantics for checking the orders are, are transformed as we expect. And at the end of this month, we, we will have a talk in this conference, the MPA, uh, that we will talk about this. Also, the disconformance between classes of Petri nets and even logs can be seen as a, as a kind of passive analysis. Also, you will find the literature called passive testing. What's the idea? Not to mess directly with the system, but to look in the data postmortem that it produced. Why? To reduce overhead, so not to directly interact with the system, but to analyze its behavior by means of the output, logs, network messages. And this is an interest for experts in trading systems, and, and they are particularly interested how we can use passive analysis techniques like these ones, and, and all, as well as other data science techniques for validating these systems. So thanks a lot for the time and for the organizers for the opportunity of presenting, even if it's a short talk. Thank you very much, Julio, for your presentation. Very, very nice, very clear. Let, let's see if people want to raise their hand and ask a question. But I wanted to ask you first, uh, even before looking at what class of uh, Petri nets uh, you should use, no? ultimately, mm -hmm. why there was the fundamental, the, the, the basic choice of Petri nets as a model? OK, so. In this case, we because we want to validate processes and the core of Petrin is to evaluate the control mm -hmm. of processes. And this, so which is the core is the control flow. So we want to validate activities in this process are in the correct order. So I can go back. Now I was wondering if you considered also the possibility to use since the beginning a different model, a different computational model. No, our work has been based on, on oh, Petri. Yes, okay. actually, the, the title of my dissertation is validation of Petri nets. A pet, sorry, validation of trading systems. A Petri net approach. Okay, so uh, going back at the beginning of your dissertation, probably you 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 there was some reason why you chose Petri nets. Maybe it's just a preference, or maybe I, I wanted to know if there is a deep reason be, beyond the choice of Petri nets. It, it, it's our area of research, and of course, I have to motivate. In, so I have yeah. to motivate in the dissertation. Why did we choose? Yeah. Okay. So it was just my curiosity. I think there is okay. Nikolai again asking a question. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes. Well, no, no, but next talk you cannot ask the question. Eh? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have two questions. First of all, why why your uh, why your title is validated? not verify, verifying modeling or something like this. What do you mean exactly under validated? And next, okay. could you, and next question is very technical. Could you please clarify what is uh, conformance in your case? Okay. Could you, could you please give formal definition? Okay, mm -hmm. Th thank you uh, for the two questions. Now, the first one was, uh, uh, why do, why, what do I mean by validation? Am I correct? Yes. Yes. So validation means, so as, as I have understood, as I have understand the terms, when we say verification means, for example, model checking. 
So mm -hmm. we have a, mo a formal model and we have a formula that we want to say if it holds or not. Validation, I understand that it's more in a general sense. So it's not only model-based verification like model checking, but we can have another means to validate behavior of the system, for example, simulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very simple. Uh, and in, in, within this validation, we consider conformant checking that could be seen as a kind of validation of the system. And conformant checking is a family of techniques from the field of process mining mm -hmm. that instead of checking a formula and a model, we are checking a real behavior that is that are in even logs. Mm -hmm. And there are two, uh, one of these techniques of one of one kind of conformant checking is the idea of replay. So can we execute in a, can we execute a trace in an even log? In a, Sorry, can we execute the model according to, to, the to the behavior observed in the log? Or more precise, I go to the example here. Is it possible to run the model as every event here indicates? So this is the idea. Sometimes it will be possible, it will fit. Some other times we have to perform some, let's call it heuristic, to force the model to be executed like the trace indicates, and we, we mark where they have deferred. And this, what I, this is what I call the deviations. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Julio. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see that the number of participants during the session, instead of dropping, are, is growing. So now we reach the <laughs> maximum number of 23. So this is for your talk. Now, uh, the next talk is Nic Nicolai. You are presenting this one, right? Uh, yes, me. Yes, Nicolai me. Shilov, Dimitri Korratiev, and Boris Feifel, platform independent model of a fixed point arithmetic for verification of the standard mathematical function. And now we have the broadest uh, audience for you, 23 people listening to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please, of, uh, first of all, please be not, not scared about by number of slides. I am going to skip many of them, but just to present the most important. Because uh, basically the, ro the role and purpose of short talk is to engage, not to explain everything. Well, First of all, I would like to explain what is our research project about. Well, formally speaking, we call our uh, approach as uh, incremental combined platform independent approach to specification and verification of standard mathematical functions. Platform independent means that we are we would not like to care about particular format of machine word, how many bits or bytes is in machine word, how in particular uh, fixed point numbers, integer numbers, uh, or floating point numbers are represented in, uh, in a particular, on particular platform. Instead, we would like to derive or design axiomatics for a uh, platform independent computer arithmetics using as basis uh, well-known ideal field axiomatics for reals or uh, rational numbers or maybe integers and up to some extent. Then uh, <clears throat> why we call our approach uh, incremental? Because, because in my opinion, this time, I would not like to say in my humble opinion, just in my opinion. Uh, the major problem with understanding verification is lack of transparency uh, when people use concrete notation. For example, doesn't matter, Cork, Isabel Hall, or first order CRM prover. Uh, notation is too complicated too complicated, uh, but instead we suggest to start with very simple verification with pen and paper, but with just single sheet of paper. Verification, manual verification designed for humans, uh, Im uh, implemented in uh, implemented uh, in simple terms using uh, 
standard ideal arithmetics and then move to verification again manual of uh, of the same algorithm but for computer arithmetics and then use uh, computer verification tools or proof assistant uh, to validate that we never in our manual proof use uh, appeals to evidence to obviousness or something like this. Uh -huh. <clears throat> then, <clears throat> what's wrong uh, with uh, specification and, com uh, and uh, computing of standard mathematical functions? Well, well, well. Uh, please don't be surprised that here is a screenshot. Uh, here are screenshots of uh, short no, uh, notes sent, sent me yesterday my, my, by my one of my sons, also Nikolai Shila. So I hope that uh, he will be much more productive and much more famous uh, in the future than me. And because of this, I hope that I will increase my citation index much more. But please don't care about details and quality. Let me explain in brief using ju ju just these two charts. First, uh, he had need and still had, has need to build uh, some spline, spline of fifth order. Uh, you know that to, if you would like to build uh, to make a spline, you need basically to solve system of linear equations. But he implemented two. Uh, he used two two functions from standard library from on Python, from uh, quite standard library from Python. But you see, the answers are quite different, quite different. And in particular, the first answer, the most straightforward. Well, uh, demonstrate uh, yellow, yellow, some strange peaks, which should not uh, be, uh, should, uh, should be, that should be absent at all. The next approach is much better, is much better, but, but it means that uh, using one or another function from a library is basically about art, not about science and technology. And basically, we believe in this particular case that the reason is in poor specification, poor validation, and no verification at all of standard functions. Why it is true? Let me draw your attention to a very simple example. Uh, basically, this example I not exactly borrow, but uh, I was very much under influence of Victor Kuliamin paper written decade ago about uh, about specification as uh, formal specification of standard mathematical functions for example let us consider how to specify for example what is what are two major trigonometric functions sine and cosine the most for, for the very first requirement is quite obvious that both functions uh, absolute values never overcome one, never overcome one. Uh, other requirements are not so obvious and uh, straightforward, but maybe we should include uh, to this requirement another requirement that, for example, the what is called the matrix trigonometric equality. Or maybe we should uh, take into account that uh, sine is an odd function and cosine is an even function, and so on. So what is indeed cosine and sine? Well, let me skip something to avoid uh, details. Mm -hmm. But if you go to uh, reference materials about uh, standard libraries, you can see very awful things. For example, here is citation from C reference available online. Read, read carefully what is written here. If no errors occur, the sign of argument is in range uh, from minus one to plus one. Well, uh, very shallow, uh, definitely relevant, but very shallow uh, requirement. The next line, the next requirement. Uh, rules out any relevance uh, of computer sign and cosine to actual sign and cosine. So it says the real uh, the result may have little or no significance 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 
if the magnitude of argument is large, no specification what is large. Well, so if you use sine and cosine, the result can be everything just in this range. Just, just in this range. So I am not, because of this, I am not surprised that uh, more complicated functions that solve uh, functions for matrices that solves uh, either invert matrix or solves a system of linear equations, well, are not so reliable because even sine and cosine are not reliable at all. Uh, basically, even implementation of sine and cosine is a challenge because of because uh, of course well known and well very old challenge because uh, people usually don't uh, assume that if uh, you have Taylor expansion it is easy to compute. Here is very straightforward implementation. Here is a, a result of experiments with very straightforward implementation of cosine using Taylor expansion. And you see, when you try to compute cosine, cosine this time, this is uh, uh, implementation, many uh, re written uh, myself implementation. If you try to compute cos uh, cosine for just 30 radians, 29th radians, basically, the result is, well, awful. It is so, uh, 100, oh, sorry. Uh, certain thousands, certain thousands, not even in the range from minus one to plus one. So uh, it is well known old challenge. What about more simple functions? What about more simple functions? Situation is uh, a little bit better with uh, a standard uh, standard function for square root. But again, read this awful statement from the reference. If no error occur. A square root of argument is returned. So, have you ever seen that standard functions for square root returns square root of two divided by two? Never. So, this statement is not a specification at all. Fortunately, if you are not so lazy and read till the very end of this reference material, you can read the very last note. No. The square root is one of few star functions that uh, should be exact. What does it mean exact? It is, it is said it is said here. It means that actually it should return not uh, not a square root of the argument, but value that differs from actual uh, actual value of square root, not more than half of the unit in the last position in the unit of the last position. Observe, this requirement is not true for sine and cosine. So sine and cosine indeed can return everything and it basically uh, may match to the specific, uh, to informal specification. So it is, quotation is written here. Well, so what do we suggest instead? So we suggest instead uh, our platform independent uh, combined incremental approach. So uh, first of all, let us let me explain how do we axiomatize uh, computer arithmetic, and then uh, give you examples and explain what right now we can do. What is our current state of the art? Uh, but from the very beginning, I would like to say that our progress is not so uh, so impressive. Please don't expect too much. But arithmetic, axiomatiz axiomatization of arithmetic is OK. First of all, we assume that uh, data type for fixed point arithmetic consists of some set of values that is a subset of rational numbers. Uh, this subset is bounded from uh, bottom and from the from the top. So we have the smallest uh, integer number, uh, sorry, uh, fixed point number, and the largest fixed point number. Number both are rational, part of rational. Then all rational numbers in this range with some fixed step are also numbers in our data type. This, this this value delta d 
in our axiomatization, in our axiomatization, plays the role of, of the unit in the last position. So delta D is data type dependent unit, unit in the last position. But observe, we don't specify what this value is exactly. Uh, we just say this value is non-zero and positive. Then also we assume that all integers in this range are E are values of, of our data type. Then instead of standard operations, plus, minus, and so on, we use even in at notational level uh, other operations, computer operations, and axiomatize them. Axiomatize them. Uh, so how much do I how much how much time do I have? I think you have uh, no time, but we are we are no problem. Five minutes, let's say. Uh, I would like to stop in two minutes because basically I just would like to present axiomatization. Okay. So, okay. okay. <clears throat> Let me explain how it works. How 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 our axiomatization axiomatization does work. For example, addition and subtraction, if without overflow, is very nice, no problem. Also, we don't axiomatize what happened in the case of overflow. But let us turn to multiplication and division because this case is much more uh, challenging. So in case if our two values from our data type, uh, well, returns actual value that is also in this data type, multiplication, then machine multiplication is equal to ideal multiplication. Same for division. So if result of multiplication and division is already valid value in our data type, then everything is okay. But if the outcome is just in this range, but not in our data type, so again, we consider, we don't consider overflow problem at all. We just consider everything is still in this range, but maybe not in our grid, not in our grid. In this case, result of machine uh, multiplication or result of machine division, well, is quite close, differs from ideal result, not more than half of the unit in the last position, exactly like in the definition of exact computations. Well, so what we are able to do right now, for example, uh, let me just, uh, it will be basically uh, my conclusion. For example, here is uh, 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 triple for computation of square root using machine arithmetics and basically precondition with post condition. Observe, post condition is almost nice. It means that ideal square root differs from computed square root, not more than desired epsilon, the user defined epsilon. And at most two units of uh, in the last position, at most two units. But still, we did we just implement we just did a verifi manual verification of this of this condition. What did we do co uh, with computer aid? What did we verify using uh, using uh, CRM proof, uh, automatic CRM proof? Basically, we validated that precondition for this. A triple is uh, is satisfiable. Observe if precondition is not satisfiable, this uh, this triple is automatically true. No need to prove anything. So using ACL two, we implemented verification that all these three conditions all together for any for any data type that satisfies our axiomatization is uh, this these five preconditions are satisfiable basically that's all that i would like to present you and i'm ready to answer your question sorry i overuse three minutes please don't claim that i overuse my right no. as organizer no maybe only two minutes because maybe you started two minutes later i, I was wrong so Nicola, you've been working for this for uh, for some time no and uh, interestingly now i understand also your son is working on this uh, on this project. So what is next? What is next? Uh, to complete our, to, uh, to, uh, to verify atom, uh, using uh, maybe ACL2, because we like ACL2, 
and have some experience all manual steps of manual verification to avoid to avoid to avoid any appeal to human evidence and human obviousness mm -hmm. and maintain I see there is a... Mm -hmm. Okay. No, there is another question, but please no continue. There is another question, but I think we can uh, we can continue for a few minutes, no problem. Uh, again, but major our major purpose is to maintain this continuity. Let me say from very transparent one page human readable and understandable proof to less readable but still human proof for computer arithmetic and then computer validation computer validation of this manual proof. Thank you. So there is a question from Andrei. Uh, Nikolai, and what about such properties as monotonicity? I know that is also sometimes a requirement for mathematical library that if the mathematical function is monotonic on some uh, in interval, then computer function uh, uh, must also be monotonic and not oscillate in uh, last uh, signature uh, digit. Uh, good question, but once again, right now we just valid, uh, verify very simple property that our computed function is exact, that is not differs, differs not more than half of unit in the last preposition. So no monotonicity, no oddity, for example, or no even uh, that function is even nothing, just ex uh, whether the function is exact indeed. But again, again, I indeed appreciate, uh, well, I uh, would like to thank Victor Kuliamin because he drew my attention to this problem, how to specify. You said, you suggested one more additional property. Why not? Maybe. Okay, I don't see, I don't see other questions from the audience. So there was very- May I add a comment there about uh, this Please. research? Yeah, Please. it is my course at Dietrich. Uh, many research about uh, machine arithmetic uh, uh, are performed in uh, big corporation, but this research are not public. They are closed, but our research is open and we believe that uh, uh, any can use the results of our research. For example, our uh, um, axiomatization of arithmetic in ACL2 is available on a GitHub repository. Is there any company that uh, con working on this that contacted you for curiosity? Anyone may I, uh, from may industry I contact? May I answer? May yeah, I answer? please. So, so, in the past, uh, two major uh, companies like uh, Intel or like uh, Sun uh, had special uh, labs for verification of standard functions. But all these projects are in the past right now. Uh, but still problem do exist, still do exist. Uh, we, unfortunately, uh, since it is progress report, uh, during the last three years, every time I try to engage uh, Huawei with this research, in particular because they have special team to implement mathematical functions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, sorry. It didn't work yet. Okay. Moreover, people don't believe that there is the a team. Problem. This team is in Moscow, right? Uh, no, in Novosibirsk. In Novosibirsk. I know the best. Okay. Because it it is part of, of it is uh, basically this team is based on uh, its core is from Intel. Mm -hmm. I, I see. Intel I see. branch in Novosibirsk, and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are saying probably this was a, was an interesting uh, thing around the year two thousand something. No, I, I suppose the companies were more ready to fund. Uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe they have also some better finances to fund this kind yeah, there of. Was this, uh, there was this decision back by it was Intel that uh, triggered a lot of research in verification. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. True, true. I agree. In the past, but yes, John Harris, uh, John yes. Harris, for example, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We are aware. We are aware. I did not provide the references, but I, the paper has. This is very good, very interesting. Uh, we are running a little bit late, but not too much. I think, uh, I mean, it's not bothering anyone. No, you can disconnect at any time. 
uh, this is the good thing about online. But uh, still, we have a lot of people today, a lot of people participating, a lot of people uh, attending. It's very good. The session is uh, finishing now. Next uh, just small advertisement. Is... Just small advertisement. Please. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. please. So tomorrow we have a, one additional talk. Natalia Garanina will present talk at the very end of our meeting tomorrow. Please make preliminary schedule according to this move, according to this shift. Sorry okay. about any inconvenience. So the end of tomorrow will be a four, at four thirty, not not at four, because there is right. an extra talk. Right. So tomorrow the workshop will start again at nine thirty. Okay. Same okay. link. Okay. Chair okay. will be Nikolai and Nikolai Shilov. And uh, thank you very much for for attending. May I ask uh, organizational question? Sure. Shall we make a conference photo? I know that in some conferences this is uh, announced that in some in a specified time uh, the participants are invited to switch on their video as uh, no prepared to be in Zoom closing and uh, then screenshot is made and uh, uh, then put on this aside. Uh, shall uh, this we is such an event? Interesting question. Let me check how to do it. Uh, just let, I never do it. I never tried it. Let me check how. To if do there it. is, a, so we are asking then, uh, before at the end of some session, which um, is expected to be uh, active, and we maybe can also before, try now. Yeah, and then when it's, uh, Tina st uh, coffee break starts, uh, then uh -huh. so uh, we can also I try see, now I to see, ask. I, a... I I see the gallery. So if people uh, will be so yeah. kind to turn camera on, please turn the camera on. Yes. Uh, let's try uh, to let's see. make today and tomorrow maybe next photo. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, from different. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, will choose if, uh, I will choose another background if it goes onto a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Kitchen is okay. Kitchen yes. is okay. Okay. So please, whoever wants, uh, switch on the camera and let's try to do this. The first time in my life I do this kind of photo, but please, never please too late. You know? in camera. Please look in camera. Yes. Well, not all people would like to do it, but nevertheless, let me make photo. I did it. So, oh, can once you, more. Ah, oh, make uh, Hrashila for joined, please. Ah, uh, Natalia joined. And Natalia, please. Natalia. We, Natalia, can, we, we could, we could not, we could not hear face. you, but uh, we can see you. Uh, oh, and, Vladimir uh, is also, Vladimir also here. Also Vladimir, we don't see the whole of your face. Uh, yes. Only eyes. Vladimir, could you please move a little bit camera to adjust a little bit? Now we see forehead. Just for, for her, but very nice for her. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, nice. Thank you. Okay, done. Done. Okay. So oh, can you show you. us the result by maybe sharing your screen? How it looks like this stuff? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Don't rush. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so see you tomorrow. Thank you very bye -bye. much for, for attending. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.